Hello, I'm Duncan Coots, and my job at IOG is I'm the architect for the Cardano node. So I've been working on the Cardano node for a long time. I was involved, but not in charge, when uh, we did the original Genesis deployment, all the way back at the beginning, uh, with Byron. My greatest claim to fame is that I led the team that did the rewrite of Cardano for uh, the Shelly release. And since then, I've been moving more into more kind of future-looking things, and, uh, and less on the kind of day-to-day. Um, so you, that's why you've heard less of me in recent years than back when we were all furiously working on Cardano Shelly. So today I want to talk about the networking layer and the peer-to-peer -peer dynamic release. The network layer of Cardano is a layer in the software in the node, uh, which sits below the consensus layer, and it supports all of the information dissemination needs of the consensus algorithm. We call it the node-to-node -node protocol, so it's a network protocol, and the node-to-node -node protocol itself consists of three what we call mini-protocols, which deal with different aspects, different kinds of information that the, the nodes need to exchange with each other to support the consensus algorithm overall. So when SPOs and users are setting up their nodes, um, well, SPOs in particular have two different roles that they can configure their nodes to fulfill. Obviously, they need to produce blocks, and so one of the roles in which they configure the node is as a block producer. And then they also set up what we call relays, which again are nodes. They're just configured in the role of relaying information rather than being the block producer. And so these different configurations are important for how we think about the overall topology of the network. And it's the topology of the network that is going to be changing a bit when we move from the current setup to the, the dynamic peer-to-peer -peer deployment. So in terms of what that means for the topology of the network, it means that there are direct connections you know, between all the SPOs and ultimately direct connections between the SPO's relays and users' nodes, which run on you know, their machines, their servers, whatever. So the dynamic peer-to-peer -peer release is going to bring a number of, of benefits. What it's really going to do is automate the way that the topology is constructed between SPO's block producers and relays, but really between the relays of the different SPO's. So in this release, it is not about connecting SPO's relays directly to end users' nodes. It's about automating the way in which the SPO relays connect to each other. Ultimately, down the line, once we've got Ouroboros Genesis, then we will be able to connect SPO relays directly to end users. And that will also rely on, on all these peer-to-peer -peer features. But in this release, the crucial thing that will be changing is about how SPA relays connect to each other. The key thing that's changing is that this is now becoming far more automated. Right now, SPOs have to use a somewhat manual configuration system to, to statically specify the set of peers that each of their relays will connect to. That will become automated in a couple different ways. Right now, SPOs have to uh, list quite a large number of other SPOs' relays, you know, by their IP address or DNS name, and they have to they have to use quite a large number of them because they need to have you know at all times a certain number of relays connected. But if you have a static list, you don't know which ones of them are going to be online or offline at a particular time. So you have to kind of over provision by having too many of them listed, really, so that you can always at least guarantee that at least a minimum number will be listed. Whereas with a a much more automated system that makes up this dynamic peer-to-peer -peer release. Instead, what happens is the entire set of all SPO relays are all available to be picked. So you don't need a static list of like 50. They're all there. And then there's a target of, let's say, 20, which can be configured, but 20 is a reasonable number. And the system will continuously ensure that that target number of connections to other SPO relays is maintained, even as other peers come and go. So that gives us better resource uh, utilization because all of these you know, upstream connections have a cost. So we don't need to over-provision. 
Okay, so the dynamic peer-to-peer -peer release then gives us a number of benefits. So we, we get better security overall because this is about resistance to whole network denial of service attacks or distributed denial of service attacks. The reason for this is that it's easier now for SPOs to configure their block producers and their relays so that their block producers are fully protected and firewalled from the rest of the internet because it, it, it makes it possible for them to configure their firewalls in such a way that all incoming connections are blocked because the block producer can make outgoing connections to the SPO zone relays without having to allow incoming TCP connections. So this is a, a security kind of simplification or improvement, depending on, on how you look at it. In addition, it's, it's also possible for block producers to set up private peering arrangements with other SPOs that are not made public. So it's possible for SPOs to list their relays publicly, but it's also possible to have hidden ones, uh, which they can connect to by private peering arrangements with other SPOs' relays. That can provide some additional resilience if someone was trying to, to conduct a denial of service attack on the entire network. It should have some improvements to the performance and scalability of the network. And this is because the way that the peer-to-peer -peer network is now constructed dynamically with the dynamic peer-to-peer -peer release follows a, I think, rather clever optimization procedure that our simulations indicate produces a, an overall result that is close to an optimal result which is a, a rather bold claim, but we do have you know, simulation data to, to back that up. What it really means is that if you were able to construct a, a perfect global network where you picked just the right connections between every single node, that's the sort of theoretical optimum. Well, it turns out that this optimization procedure that we have based on purely local information gets us quite close, reasonably close, to that global optimum, which is a really good result. So what this is telling us is that the fully automated procedure, as compared to what people might do manually, gives us a really good result in terms of the overall time it takes for blocks to be broadcast over the network. So people might be worried that the peer-to-peer -peer will like, you know, increase delays because people might think that they can manually pick really, really good choices. And they probably can pick really good choices manually. But first of all, we don't have to do it manually anymore. Second of all, you know, this should give us a really good global result in terms of block diffusion time, the, the time it takes to get blocks across the network. So maybe let's recap the history of the networking layer and where it is now and where it's going and how this dynamic peer-to-peer -peer release fits within that overall context. So back at the beginning, when we had you know, the Byron release and things were federated, we had a federated network topology. And what that meant was that you know, IOG was running all the block producing nodes at the beginning, and all the relays. When we had the, the big Shelley release, we decentralized the production of blocks by having SPOs become involved, SPO block producer nodes, and SPO relays. But we still have IOG providing a number of relays to support uh, end users, merchants, exchanges, you know, deadless users, etc. And that's what we have now, is this kind of hybrid mode. It's a hybrid between a peer-to-peer and a federated topology, because the way in which SPOs connect to each other is actually a peer-to-peer -peer network, although it's a manually configured peer-to-peer -peer network. So the dynamic peer-to-peer -peer release changes that by automating that part. It changes it from being manually configured to being fully automated. The next step involves the deployment of Ouroboros Genesis. Ouroboros Genesis is a later variation of the Ouroboros algorithm, that was published you know, as an academic paper uh, a few years ago. And it, it brings, in some sense, like the final important piece of the Ouroboros jigsaw, which is how to properly, securely boot from Genesis, which means you know, how do you securely join the network later on, as opposed to joining it you know, from, from when it started right at the beginning. And it provides a properly peer-reviewed, mathematically proven algorithm for securely being able to establish trust in the, in the chain later on without needing any other trusted intermediaries. The dynamic peer-to-peer -peer release gives us the mechanism for the peer-to-peer -peer network, but the enabler to allow end users into that system, into that peer-to-peer -peer network, is Ouroboros Genesis. And then a final 
phase of the peer-to-peer -peer and the networking layer rollout is a feature that we call peer sharing. And what that really means is that it's not just SPOs who can have relays in the network. Once we have peer sharing, it means that anybody, not just SPOs, can provide their machines to act as relays. So that's the, you know, the phases or the network layer rollout. So let's talk about how this has been developed and how it is being rolled out. This has been a long time in the making. It's gone through quite a long research and development phase. I mentioned earlier simulations. We did quite an extensive research collaboration where we looked at a lot of the theory and, as I said, lots of simulations to try and figure out a local mechanism, meaning local is in the sense of only relying on information that is locally available to each node so that nodes don't have to trust each other. A local mechanism for establishing a global outcome, which is minimizing the time for blocks to be broadcast across the network. Then there was a development phase, including very extensive internal testing in simulated environments using a technique that we use extensively called property-based testing. Uh, in this case, property-based testing in an IO network simulation. And then we have been running it with a few SPOs uh, who've been very helpful with uh, sort of pre-production versions, trying things out, running versions of peer-to-peer -peer enabled relays in the mainnet for some time but just as a sort of private nodes that, that we were running and monitoring, or one or two that you know, certain SPOs were helping us with. And now we're finally getting to the stage of an inclusion into, into a main release, and that we're asking all SPOs to start to try. Now, the way that this is being rolled out is carefully, carefully, you know, step by step. So in particular, it's not something that gets turned on automatically as soon as you upgrade. It's something that is enabled in configuration. The node can be run in either the peer-to-peer -peer mode or the old mode. So it's something where everybody can opt in at the right time for them. So what we're asking SPOs to do initially is a one relay setup where at least one of their relays is run in the peer-to-peer -peer mode. And then as we go through the, the rollout, we'll be recommending SPOs to try configuring their block producer in the peer-to-peer -peer mode, which means that they have to start thinking about how does their relay and their block producer communicate with each other? And then eventually we get to the stage where SPOs can just have all of their block producers and relays uh, running in peer-to-peer -peer mode. I hope that has been interesting and a little bit enlightening about uh, what's happening with the network layer and the peer-to-peer -peer release. So we collected a number of questions from the community, in particular I think from SPOs, and so I'm going to quickly uh, run through some of them. Cold peers, hot peers and warm peers are part of how the new peer-to-peer -peer internals work. Uh, there's the what we call the peer-to-peer -peer governor or the outbound governor keeps track of all of its peers in one of these states. So cold peers are peers that the node knows about but there's no connection to them. Warm peers is where there is an established connection but it's being used really for monitoring purposes, performance evaluation purposes, but not being used for the consensus protocols themselves. And then hot peers are ones where the peer is being used, the connection to that peer is being used for uh, the consensus protocol. Peers are promoted and demoted between these different temperatures, if you like. It, it turns out that the research and the simulations that we did indicate that we can have extremely simple policies for uh, the promotion and demotion. It, it turns out that we only need a clever policy in one place. So the promotion from cold to warm, we can make it random, and that's what we do. The promotion from warm to hot, we also make random. The only time that we have a very clever policy is the demotion from hot to warm. And that's done by making continuous measurements of, um, technically, it's which peers gave us the least useful headers within the last period of time. So, you know, which were least often the peer that gave a header first? Those are the worst peers, and we demote a couple of the worst peers, and we then randomly promote a couple more. And that is enough for the optimization procedure to work overall. What is a hidden node? I mean, I think what you mean by a hidden node is one that is not registered as an SPO relay. And of course, it's already possible to run relays 
and just not register them on the blockchain as an SPO relay. So in some sense, yes, it is possible now and it will be possible in the future. The difference is that what do you gain or lose for a, for a hidden node? A hidden node that's not listed, not registered as, a, as an SPO's relay, it will not receive incoming connections from other SPOs that are using the peer-to-peer -peer mode because they're hidden, they're not known about. They can still make outgoing connections, but they won't receive incoming ones. Unless, of course, you make you know, private peering arrangements with other SPOs because you can tell another SPO, here is the IP address or the DNS name of my hidden node, and they can configure their relays so not just to you know, do the general thing of automatically connecting to a selection of, let's say, you know, 20 other SPOs relays, but it's possible in the peer-to-peer -peer configuration to select particular groups with particular targets. You can say, I would like to always keep at least one connection to these two relays or two connections to these three relays or something like that. And that could include the hidden relays of another SPO that you have a, a private peering arrangement with. So in that sense, yes, it will still be possible to run hidden nodes. Ledger peers are peers that are picked from the ledger. Remember that SPOs can register their relays on the chain. These are the relays that everybody knows about. So in the dynamic peer-to-peer -peer layer, when, when nodes are thinking about which peers are they going to pick, the general pot of peers that they can pick from are the ones that are registered on the ledger. You know, this is the set of peers that an SPO would configure their relays to connect to because an SPO wants to configure their relays to connect to other SPOs. So the relationship between Ouroboros and peer-to-peer -peer is that they are kind of technically mostly independent of each other, but you need both of them before you can enable end users to take part in the peer-to-peer -peer network. So if you like... Peer-to-peer -peer provides the mechanism at the network layer. It, it does the actual organization of the topology, which is the mechanism by which nodes, including in the end, uh, end user nodes, exchanges, etc., take part in the, in the network, establish their connections, etc., etc. But its Ouroboros genesis is the enabler that makes it secure for those end users to do so. So the short answer to this one is no, but you probably won't need to do that. It does not provide that feature directly. That is a feature that you would need to do via your own firewall. But the interesting thing is that you should not need to do this at all, probably in, in, with the dynamic peer-to-peer -peer release, because it's possible to establish a, a connection in the other direction. So probably the premise of the question is, is someone imagining their block producer node accepting incoming connections from their relay. But that's not the way that we're going to recommend these things be configured. That would still be possible, but the way we would recommend is instead for the block producer to establish a connection outgoing to the relay. And the relay already has to accept connections from all over the place anyway, if it's a public relay. And, and that will work because one of the key improvements in the peer-to-peer -peer release is that every connection is potentially bidirectional which means the consensus protocols can be run in both directions on that same TCP connection, which means it doesn't matter who connected to who in which direction initially for which direction in which the consensus protocols run. So you can have A connect to B or B connect to A, and either can be upstream or downstream of each other depending on how they're configured and the state of, state of those two nodes. So the recommendation for the typical setup is going to be Block producer establishes an outgoing connection through its firewall to the relays, to its own SPO relays, and then blocks all incoming connections. Because there will not need to be any incoming connections, because it's the outgoing ones that can still be used in both directions. So hopefully that reassures for that setup. Okay, that's it. And for more information, you can follow on Twitter or for more technical discussion, you can join the Discord.